Previously on Podcast Without Pretense. Man, I just can't wait for CES. CES is going to be fun. I can't wait to sit in a trailer for seven days. Men are wearing leggings now? I didn't... I don't... Yeah, that was a controversial episode. (laughs) Very, very troubling. Uh, It was about a six-hour episode. One of the longest episodes we've ever done in the history of this show. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah. mainly it was because Aya showed up in leggings. Uh, mainly because well, he yeah. wanted to show up. Which, yeah. <laughs> which, one of, which one of us is Aya's? Uh, that would be me. Unclear. Normally I wear, I wear uh, th- those were camo leggings. You weren't supposed to be able to see them, but that's yeah. a bunch of bullshit. Let's just see a torso floating in midair. Okay, <laughs> so who's the other guy who's on the show that's not Aya's and not me? Oh, I'm Eric, I guess. I think. Uh, I, Eric, I, I guess, I'm, is a great last name. <laughs> and then I'm I'm Jonathan Strickland. That was the worst way to introduce ourselves possible. Well, <laughs> you're well. I just had to guess because I think I'm not you, but unclear. <laughs> we, it's we have no it's been a long that. it's been a long year, guys. It's been a really long year, and we yeah. watched a really bad movie for today. And this it's is true. your pick, right, Jonathan? Yeah i I picked this. I was kind of hoping we wouldn't really focus on that part. Uh, I picked. No, we can. I think it's going to be short. Like my notes are short. <laughs> I didn't okay, even yeah. bother taking notes. I do have some very important things I want to say, but I didn't take any notes. Uh, but it's it's we did invasion of the star creatures, which I didn't look into enough. I should have. If I had realized it was supposed to be a comedy, I, I wouldn't have picked it. I would. I was just thinking it was a B science fiction it film, like, like one of those yeah, super works. super low budget but earnest science fiction movies that's what i thought it was when i went into it not realizing it was supposed to be a comedy uh because you know when it's a bad science fiction movie it can be sublime when it's a bad comedy it's just awful and that's kind of what this was yeah yeah well what what we do on this show uh, i asked what what was it that we do with the movies why don't you explain all right, because we live in such a, a, a technological world where we all have our second screens and multiple distractions, what we've decided on this show to do is uh, we'll pick a movie that we think will be somewhat unbearable. It seems to be that's the, at least the, that's the underlying tone of the picks we make. Sometimes we pick actually genuinely good movies. And the idea is we basically keep track and see how long it takes for us to break and to take a second screen or have some other distraction, whether it's another person, whether it's a beer, whatever it may be. If it's a distraction, then that's when your time is up. We have said, though, that taking notes during the movies is not a distraction. It is not a second screen. It's just merely uh, a nice way to get some, some ideas out. And so I don't think we've ever counted that as a distraction. Otherwise, we'd be at zero all the time. I no, think we, we had... I think early on, the first time I ever took notes, you guys had uh, had put up a bit of a protest saying that it was a bit of a distraction. And I argued that taking notes made me focus even more on the movie, uh, which meant that I was paying way more attention than anyone else. And like, OK, that's fair. It's only when you start to have to pause the movie so that you can write, which is for <laughs> me, any any movie that's from the asylum requires lots of pausing. Uh, so. Uh, but this movie, I didn't take any notes, so that that was not the case. So, so I asked, how long into the film did you last before you gave up and either went with a second screen or just walked away? Uh, Thirty-five minutes and forty-two seconds is as far as I got before I had to just like just start talking. Like I just yeah. couldn't stand this piece of shit. At about forty-three sixteen, I I kind of gave up and watched like the rest of the movie and fast forward, and I just jumped until I saw. Native Americans pop up. Then I was like, hey, oh, what, geez. what's happening? Yeah, we're that, gonna talk about that. Okay. Yeah, we'll get to this. <laughs> Eric? So so that's 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 about my time. I made it thirty one minutes into the movie and then <laughs> restarted it again. And the second time through, I looked up at some point, saw Native Americans and went, Wait, hold on. I gotta pay attention now. <laughs> uh I got about the same amount of time into it as you guys. It was somewhere I didn't write it down, but it was somewhere in that. It, it was right after they got uh, they got captured by the force field, which is right in that thirty minute mark. Right, it was yeah, right yeah. in there. Um, 
And then uh, now I kept it going. I didn't fast forward. I just had it going, but I wasn't paying very much attention. Went into the kitchen, made myself a sandwich, ate a sandwich. But, I, you know, I, I'm still within view of the TV, but I'm no longer paying close attention. And then the Native American part happened. Yeah. And and that suddenly means- we were. We were a hair's breadth away from the hate that was in Rock and Roll Frankenstein. Right. That's that's exactly what I thought. Like the sad part is, is like, yeah, I, I, I got to that point and I'm like, I, I you know, I, I can't watch. Like I have to do something else. So I think I was read, just reading like an RSS feed. And then I look up, you know, 10, 15 minutes later and I'm like, Whole, what is going on now? <laughs> there is Native Here's Americans. The, there and the, the really crazy thing is this movie. Well, the theatrical release was seventy minutes, but I think the cut we got had a bonus of ten extra minutes. Oh, in it. fantastic! <laughs> yeah. Now, now yeah, about version. about eight and a half of those minutes all involved uh, uh, these these Native Americans doing a stereotypical Native American dance and chant. <laughs> For for about eight and a half minutes. I mean, that's how long yeah. it felt that scene was. And it, it seems was, like it, it, was ha- it has no it has no bearing on anything. Like no, but because that's the thing is, should... I rewinded it once I saw that, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, well, we should, I missed. We should something. explain. <laughs> we should explain yeah. what this movie is about. So it is a science fiction comedy. It was it was made in 1962. I actually looked up the the guy who wrote the um both the story and the screenplay, Jonathan Hayes. Uh, has another claim to fame. He played the lead character on the original Little Shop of Horrors. Not the musical, but the Roger Corman film that the musical is based oh, off wow. of. So he was, he was, you know, fully qualified to write a shitty movie. Um, there's some things that we need to point out. First of all, our, our main characters in this are a pair of privates, not genitalia but rather privates in the army um although you could call them dicks there was a private philbrick and private pen how long did you have that joke in the chamber how long i just came up with it literally i did not i did not i did not pre-plan this uh but anyway these are the two main characters they're these they're these two army screw-ups and they're supposed to be funny, but they're not. Uh, no. it, they're, they're kind of like, it's kind of like getting an Abbott and Costello pairing if both were totally brain dead. <laughs> if uh, they so were both the straight man. <laughs> yeah, or, or both the clown, but neither yeah. of them were a funny clown. Yeah. Right? So, so they don't play off each other very well. The jokes are terrible. I mean, the jokes, the, it, to me, it seems like Jonathan Hayes perhaps was familiar with the structure of a joke and knew that a joke (laughs) typically has a setup and a punchline, but he wasn't really certain how those two things actually relate to one another to make a true joke. That's the feeling I got. Um, So anyway, these two privates are screwing around on base and then they end up getting assigned by a wacky colonel who's wacky. Uh, oh, to a, a yeah, he comes the back. Jive, the the quote unquote jive talking colonel. No, that's no, no. sergeant. That's oh no, that's, that's the sergeant. sergeant. I'm sorry, that yeah. is the sergeant. The yeah. sergeant was jive talking. <laughs> yeah, um, the colonel was was a crazy son of a bitch. So anyway, <laughs> they they are assigned to go with this sergeant and a couple of other folks to go check out uh, uh, a particular area outside the base. And that's where they encounter the cave dwelling of a pair of aliens, female aliens. They look Wait. human. You've, uh, you've what? skipped a major part of this. So the, the idea is that the um, <laughs> this area that they're investigating, there was a bunch of nuclear testing. And then yeah. a cave was uncovered. And so these, oh, right, right, these right. two, right. plus I think another three or four uh uh, members of the army are sent to investigate the area. Now, if you see the other bunch that go with the two idiots, you go, okay, well, I can kind of see why they're going. Why yeah. Colonel Wackadoo, whatever the hell his name is, sends out the two morons, I don't think that's ever really explained, other than maybe potentially they're super really fucking expendable. Maybe. Yeah. I, 
I also, I never I also cared think, enough. Like, we're also skipping over the when I got clued in that this was a comedy, which was the second time I watched it. Right. <laughs> the second. <laughs> So did you watch it the first time? It didn't it didn't occur to you that the zany shenanigans going on were no, supposed know. to be funny. But what I realized this was just supposed to be ridiculous was when I watched it the second time. And in the first two seconds, it is the production company. Like the first text that appears on the oh, screen yeah. is R I ridiculous. Yeah, I and I was, was like, funny. oh. I got it. What? And then, and, and then and it's something was, like it, it, this was a true story. Only the facts have been completely distorted. Which I so thought it's like, like that. So part, it's like Fargo. That part, <laughs> yeah, that part I thought, <laughs> oh, well, this is this could actually be fairly amusing. It's it's right. very much self-aware. <laughs> but then it immediately tanks after that. Like the, the right. performances and the jokes are terrible. You get yeah, a lot of slapstick. Only note, my only note after that was, God damn it. I loved Fallout. <laughs> 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 well, so so Eric's <laughs> brain went to a safe place, um, but no, it was a uh, yeah, it was just a lot of slapstick, bad sound effects, that kind of stuff. Anyway, they they go to the cave to check it out. Uh, they then go through a set that is essentially a series of slightly you know slight ramps that lead to exits, either stage left or stage right. So there's like four of them. You, can, you go down a little bit. There's another exit. You can go down a little bit. There's an exit. Go down a little bit. And you're just looking straight on. It looks like a, a play set. Like it's there's no depth to it. It's just this little series of ramps. Get used to this set. <laughs> You'll see it <laughs> because, at least six times. <laughs> no, not six. OK, so I, I watched it. The, I and the, <laughs> the gag, the gag is they do it like it's Scooby Doo, right? Where there's the hallway with all the doors, and you see him running through the different doors, and uh, you know shenanigans happen as characters are running from one door into another, and the bad guys coming out, and then occasionally the char- good guys are chasing the bad guy, that kind of stuff. Same sort of concept, except really, really done in a terrible way. Not at all funny, but don't worry. The sixteenth time they do it, <laughs> it's still not funny. So. What you mean when they when they break the walls and and jump between the different levels of the set? That blew my mind. Like I it, didn't it expect was, it. It's so god awful. So god awful. <laughs> but anyway, they they do that gag like I said about 16 times. That's not an exaggeration. Every time any character needs to go anywhere in the cave, they have to go through this goddamn set of ramps. <laughs> that has them going through wacky teleportation and ending up right where they, they started. And uh, it's just the cheapest, dumbest gag ever. And it's not funny. Uh, but anyway, they encounter these two women that are supposed to be like these statuesque Amazons. I looked at, uh, the aliens, female aliens, uh, right. that look human, but very tall. I looked up. We're these... about five foot seven. It seems <laughs> one was five, maybe foot... <laughs> one was five foot nine and the other was five foot 11. I looked no, it when up. We start, okay. When we start the movie, they do like a nice either a forced perspective kind of gag or something where they the women actually look gigantic. And yeah. then for some reason, I think like in the very next scene where they're in the same room together, they basically throw this idea out entirely. They're no longer yeah, no, giant no. space women. They're just like the same height with two inch heels. It's not like they even show you the feet on these women. They don't even bother to give them like giant platforms <laughs> to make them somewhat taller. Two inch heels. Well, yeah. they do. It, it they was totally taller. the next scene. It was the next scene because they're they're standing on like a platform in one scene. And then the next scene, you're just like, oh, well, I thought we were going with an Amazon thing. But apparently we're not. They're, they're they, just... they, <laughs> they are definitely taller than the leads. But then at the end of the movie, the leads are standing in front of some other soldiers who are taller than they are. And you realize <laughs> oh, these guys are just short. <laughs> the women aren't aren't super tall. These guys are just short. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, the women capture the the privates, again the soldiers, uh, yeah. and as well as their compatriots, although they don't know that at the time being. And they ex- the women explain that they have come to Earth to study it, uh, and that they are planning on colonizing it, and they're going to uh, very shortly get back into their rocket ship and head home to report back so that they can have essentially an invasion force come in. And the two soldiers uh, say that they would rather not have that happen, but then they get thrown into a force field, which is, uh, which is one of two things. It's either a pane of glass that they then 
press their faces up against so that they have the funny smushed nose look or it's nothing at goddamn all <laughs> nothing at all i'm pretty sure it's just it them miming nothing at all yeah no, it, no there's there's a couple of totally scenes miming. where you can see them sp- but there are a couple of scenes oh, where is? you see them pressing their nose yes no, just, there's definitely glass attention. jonathan's right there's yeah. glass but there's also like when he's talking about nothing Okay, so there's a lot of scenes where, not a lot of, there's a bunch of them where the two characters are trying to mime as if something's in the way. It's like neither one were told where the line was going to be <laughs> in the wall yeah. because we've seen that they both can press up against this thing. So it's kind of a flat plane. But later on, they're trying to do this and they're like totally breaking it. Each of them does not seem to be aware of what the other one is doing as actors, let alone I, the I characters. I think that I miss there being any actual glass in any of these scenes because I remember watching them being like, this is the worst miming I've ever seen. Like the, they're next to each other and yeah. like further out. <laughs> At the very beginning of that sequence that mm. you see the glass because there's smudges on it already from a previous take where they had pressed uh. their faces against it. <laughs> they're oily, greasy faces. Um, <laughs> so the, the women leave them alone. Also, you, I forgot to mention, there are also these giant vegetable humanoids that the women cultivate and that acts as their muscle for them. Oh, right. The males uh, of the species. That's right. Well, no, yeah. wait a second. There's, there's, I thought there's different, three of them, right? So there's the, the females, the males, and then the veggie men, which I think is a great name, by the way. Veggie men. Well, the I veggie, my... the veggie men are just the, the pre men, right? I thought they were a third race of people that were going to take over their planet, but they somehow took over by killing the, like the heads of the veggie men. So maybe I got that totally wrong. Jonathan. No, I think you're right. I I think you're right. I as I think you're right. Eric obviously was not paying attention to this movie. I mean, Um, I didn't know it was a comedy. (laughs) (laughs) Until the second viewing. So maybe. Maybe. (laughs) He watched it twice and paid attention to it half as much the second time. (laughs) It's Um, very possible. (laughs) Well, at any rate. So did you did you hear what the names of the two female aliens are? I've got them written down. Actually, I remember them. It's, oh, it's okay. Professor Tanga and Dr. Oh, what is it? It begins with a P, uh, right? What is it? Puna. I don't have it written Puna. Down. Oh, Thank you. Puna. So you have you have Puna <laughs> and, and Tanga. Tanga. Oh. Puna Tanga. Hmm. That's classy, huh? Was I the only one who picked up on that? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Okay. All right. Well, then that's, <laughs> I... I was like, what? Puna Tanga? Are you kidding me? Uh, so there's some misogyny going on in this movie. At any rate, uh, wait, oh, just well, a little bit? Just a little? There's well, it's some. interesting because because <laughs> at first the women are talking about how they they have their shit together. Right. And like the Actually, and the men are yeah. and the men are total idiots. They're total morons. And you're like, right. oh, this is actually kind of encouraging, right? Because no, I actually made this argument. It, well, not made this argument, but <laughs> as I'm watching it, my girlfriend comes home about a half hour through, and I'm like, actually, this movie's really kind of weird for 1962. And then yeah. she starts watching it as well, and we get to the end. This is the second time I watched it, and she's like, what the hell just happened? <laughs> yeah. No, no, there's a big turn. Well, first of all, so so – the two idiots get free of the force field in a way that doesn't make any sense. Um, they're, they're trying to hypnotize one of the veggie men. And of course, because they're zany, madcap, stupid people, one of them ends up getting hypnotized by the other one and then just magically gets outside the force field in a way that's never explained. Like he, he's just, he's, he's um, hypnotized and then he's on the other side of the force field. He manages to eventually, after lots of, zany shenanigans with the control board turn off the force field for the second guy to get out. And then they try to escape the cave. This takes approximately four hours. Where, wait, does, uh, wait, doesn't, yeah. doesn't one of them kiss the, the girl before not, not they're in yet. the force field? Not yet. Is that not yet? Okay. No, that's yet, after yeah. the force field. Okay. So I just got to talk about the, I got to talk about the control board. Okay. Uh, okay. So, so we got this scene. We got uh, it's it's Phil Brook or Phil Brick. That's his name. He's the he's the dumber of the two, which is weird yeah. because they're Same. both pretty they're both pretty fucking stupid. Um, so it's Phil uh, Brick, he somehow gets past this shield. He gets to a wall. Now, I I'm not like a set decorator. I haven't designed anything. 
but effectively you see like an alarm bell, what appears to be like two, like just metal cutouts of circles and just a bunch of like little knickknacks on this big giant white board. And so this <laughs> idiot continuously pushes every single button, except something on the right side, which kept catching my eye. He refused to touch it. And I'm like, why will he not do that? But he never does. And because we go to this scene twice, I might add. So the first time he's doing this, he's like, oh, there's a bell, and there's a honking noise, and there's a thing. Then you see his exasperated uh, friend, uh, Penn, on the other side just freaking out like, oh, well, this is going to take a while. We go back, and he's still doing the same freaking thing. And there's nothing specific about the sequence. Not that I should really be looking into it that much at that point. <laughs> but I was kind of like, please tell me he's finally going to hit that thing on the right side. <laughs> that he never fucking touches in either shot. So there was some kind of sequence there. And sorry to just rant about that control board, but that was such a <laughs> shitty design. I mean, this is a cheap ass looking movie. I mean, not like yeah. Mummy Maniac. Shit, oh no, just all the like, all the sets were bad. This was some um, shit when it came to like, oh yeah. look, and the I audio. Don't know. I times. think it, well, it was better than Mummy Maniac, but that's mainly Everything because is- if you shoot it in a low frame rate in black and white. You're gonna look better than Mommy Maniac. <laughs> well, to to build on this, so so they they try to make their escape, but rather than escaping, they end up encountering the women again. They they go further into the cave, and um, they're taken captive again. So you're like, wow, absolutely nothing has happened. These two characters got captured got out of the force field and got captured again. Mm-hmm. However, this is the point. And that whole like force field section could have been cut from the movie. There was no reason for it to be there. It didn't add anything. It certainly didn't add comedy. So uh, <laughs> the, they encounter the women again. This time, uh, Professor Tanga leaves Dr. Puna alone with them to guard them. They demonstrate the use of their disintegrator pistols by zapping uh, two of the veggie men and, and destroying them and say, now, you know, if you try to escape, that's the same fate will, will fall on you. So professor Tanga leaves. Dr. Puna is still there. And Phil Brick and Penn are trying to figure out how they're going to get away. And Phil Brick decides he's going to try and romance uh, Puna. And so uh, Penn gives him a little bit of suggestion about, you know, go in there and like a French movie star. And uh, uh, so Phil Brick goes and he tries to romance her. And, and despite the laws of God and man, it works. And so um, he he tries to tell her about love. She doesn't quite get it. Uh, he tries to tell her about embracing. She thinks that involves breaking his back. And then he tells her about kissing. He kisses her. And when he kisses her, her mind short circuits because she's a dame. So her brain melts space down. Space dame. She's a, she's a space, space dame. Space dame. Yeah. And uh, so her space dame brain melts down. And then because she's just in a daze, just, just smiling and looking off into the distance, they make their escape. This time, they actually find their way out of the cave using a brilliant method of following the flame on a lighter because they they feel a draft makes no sense. Yeah. Uh, but at any rate, they, you know, all of these times, every single time we're talking about anyone going anywhere, remember they go through that one sequence of, of, uh, ramps that are all connected to each other. And I mean, every single damn time. And the joke is never funny. Um, they get outside and immediately the, uh, Professor Tanga comes back, finds out what's happened to Dr. Puna. They send the veggie men after the, the privates who make their way up a hill and then try to crush the veggie men with rocks, like giant boulders uh, that are up on the hill because they go uh, out in this rocky desert terrain. Right. So they push these they, giant when boulders they leave down. the cave, I remember actually thinking that when they run out of the cave, they're running through multiple different shots of the same cave. And all yeah. of the boulders are circles. Yeah. And, or like or spheres, and I like I remember actually sitting there going, "No, that's not how the <laughs> like rocks look around." Uh, so wait, like, so so wait a second. The seven feet tall veggie men, <laughs> which by the way, I I want to talk about the introduction of the veggie men because we get them really early in the movie. And what happens is they, all the before anybody gets captured, the whole team finds. 
uh, what appears to be, like what I saw, at least on my giant TV, a burlap sack under a, ro a rock. That's all I could really make out of this thing. So then they're Seems like, oh, right. it must be. It's like, this is some kind of creature. I'm like, how the hell are they getting that's a creature? That's a bag. Then they're like, oh, I might surmise that it's an extraterrestrial because it doesn't look like a man. I'm like, where the fuck are they getting this? So I'm not understanding this at all until this thing stands up and it's a seven foot uh, person in tights. I assume are brown tights and some kind of like jolly green giant style kind of like leggings tunic. If you will. Yeah, there's like a tunic on top of it <laughs> and they have like this burlap sack and like some kind of like either porn or some kind of straw sticking out of their masks. I'm pretty so sure those like, were just branches. <laughs> so they, they, they kind of look like either some kind of scarecrow thing or some kind of like, you know, it, this could be very demented if done right. But vegetables was not the first thing I thought about with the freaking yeah. veggie men. And by the way, in every freaking shot where they were going up and down the ramps, they can't see what they're doing. So there's a shit ton of stumbling by the veggie men who are supposed to be like menacing, right? They're yeah. so strong as the boulders are coming at them because they're just kind of, they kind of move like this. Um, when the boulders come at them, I believe they just kind of pick them up and you can see that the boulders are bouncing towards them in such a mm -hmm. natural way. I'm sure Eric noticed that too. Right. <laughs> and, and this weightless beach ball style, they pick it up and just toss it. So the, the veggie men, <laughs> the big threat, the seven foot, monsters are just like some poor poor guys i think maybe they had maybe had three of them maybe two of them because they keep using the same guys i'd imagine i, I, no I think there were two i never saw three on screen at the same time i did see <laughs> <Yeah>. two <laughs> that, I, you know i just want to point out that papier mache boulders can be just as deadly as the real thing <laughs> um, at any rate the 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 veggie men quickly toss the boulders aside and so the two the two soldiers start running to try and their their plan is to go back to the base, tell the colonel, get some help. And they are running uh, as fast as they can. And then Penn stops Philbrick and says, "We we can't just keep running. They're gonna catch up to us. We gotta stop and fight them." Keep in mind that they just saw these guys. I mean, assuming that what you're seeing in the movie is supposed to be real. They just saw these veggie men pick up boulders that would have weighed 500 pounds and toss them <laughs> aside. Like let's stop and fight them. And so then you get the zany fight sequence, which doesn't really go anywhere. But just as the veggie men finally get the upper hand after all the antics have subsided, uh, they get called back to the rocket ship. And, uh, so the, the soldiers are talk debating about whether they go back to try and rescue their fellow soldiers whom they actually did see while they were trying to make their way out of the cave. Um, but the, the, all of them were in suspended and motion as one, as Penn hilariously observes, yes. um, whether or not they should go back and try and rescue them, despite the fact they nearly just got their asses handed to them, or if they should go on and try and convince the colonel about what was going on, despite the fact that they're going to sound like crazy people. They eventually go back to the colonel. The colonel thinks they sound like crazy people. But then Phil Brick, you know, the dumber of the two, uh, uh, ends up quoting a, a science fiction serial character, like a, not, a, not a breakfast cereal, but S-E-R-I-A-L, like a serial series. Like, like uh, the podcast. Yeah, like like I and I can't even remember what is I can't even remember what the character's name is, like Captain Cosmo or something like that. And um and so it turns out that the colonel's also a big fan. They both belong to the same branch of the fan club. They both have the secret decoder ring. They know the secret handshake. And it turns out that in the fan club, the private has a higher rank than the colonel does. So he starts to boss the colonel around, and the colonel, because he's wacky goes along with it because he's he's so dedicated to this same fandom and they decide to go back out without any other help <laughs> the three of them go back out to try and rescue the rest of the men wait, wait, wait. is this the scene that i missed before we meet the village people is yes. this what i didn't rewind to oh yeah God. this is what i fast forwarded right. to so i'm finding I, out for the first time what happened. <laughs> oh you didn't see this part huh no I so yeah yeah he he um yeah they they do this whole like secret handshake thing and they they do their decoder rings like meanwhile Penn is just kind of standing there like a dumbass because he has nothing to contribute because he's not part of the fan club 
Uh, and that's how Phil Brick convinces the Colonel to go along with him. It's because he outranks him within the fan club. So mm -hmm. they go back out uh, and then they encounter a tribe of Native Americans as they're making their way back to where the cave is. And um, and now we're in a Western. Like before and, and, we were in a science fiction film, now we're in a Western. And there isn't there – there's a random scientist dude – who I don't understand and who doesn't seem to play any part in this is, is that also a part of the, the guy he's in an outfit. Oh, good. Thanks. God, thanks, Eric. I thank God. Cause you know, everyone else in this fucking movie was a nudist. This guy, he was in an outfit. God damn it. You're such an idiot, Eric. Use your words. He was in an outfit. Jesus Christ, he, Eric. Come he, on. He was okay. So we meet the mid Native American guys. Most of yes. them are in a very racist Native American outfit, except for the soldiers. <laughs> then we have a guy who is a scientist who seems to be wearing some sort of weird outfit. I think he has a helmet on that looks like a water cooler top. Oh, that's the colonel. That's what I've got. That's the colonel. He's wearing yeah, a, the colonel. some kind of gas mask thing because okay. because it's yet again I I've, I've said I missed this scene. <laughs> I didn't it's know the that same, was the colonel. It's the same wacky colonel from the beginning of the movie. The same the same wacky guy who sent yeah. them on the mission in the first place. Except now he's wearing his space helmet. Right. Um, but he's so wacky. That's, that's your talking. He's not jive talking. The jive talking no. is still the same. that's the sergeant. sergeant. Glory. Yes. <laughs> Does he freaking disappear in the middle of the movie? I know that he's like in a he's like basically in suspended animation for a while. Does he ever get out of it? I maybe I guess he's out at the very end of it. I think you see him at the very end, but he's he doesn't have any speaking role at that point. Yeah, he he talks a lot like uh uh the the character from um the original film The Producers, not not the musical, not the one that was done with Nathan Lane, but the one with Zero Mostel and Gene Wilder. He comes across as the actor who ends up playing Hitler. Yeah, baby, that's cool. That kind of character. Uh, Daddy-o. Anyway, um, so the, the getting back do, to the... Do more. I need to cut those and isolate them. <laughs> because that's also... Like, you're doing it dead on, man. You just got to say man yeah. a lot, too. Cat. Yeah, listen listen here, man. <laughs> Stay cool, Daddy-o. We're going to go on a... down talk to the colonel. <laughs> and that guy was the sergeant, so he outranked the privates, and he I don't know why... On a military base, by the way, in the early part of the movie, why he's right. even addressing the privates that way, and yeah. he's trying like, to be cool when he's talking to them, like walking by, and you're, and that, yeah, it makes no sense. Well, at any rate, also they, that is one of my favorite scenes where he bursts out of the trash can because of a cigar for some odd reason. <laughs> <laughs> well, his obviously he was catching on fire. Wouldn't you right. burst out of a trash can if you were catching on fire? Right, and and Jeez. and go. 10 feet into the air, 20 to feet, only maybe. be caught by Sergeant yeah. Glory later on. Of course. Right. The, yeah. the rules, <laughs> the rules of this universe are those of uh, Looney Tunes, but at any rate, so, so they're finally with the fucking native Americans. Can I finish the goddamn story? <laughs> this is how the movie kind of goes, by the way. That's exactly what you're thinking at this point. Yeah. Sorry. Continue. Yeah. So, yeah. so yeah, the native Americans are, uh, they end up offering them. First of all, they speak in the most racist stereotypical <laughs> approach ever. Like, Holy like, shit, yeah like Tonto multiplied by a thousand. And then they, um, you know, they offer him a peace pipe because of course they're native Americans. So they have to do that. Then everyone starts to hallucinate and dance and play the drums for about eight and a half minutes. And it's just this <laughs> it's, dancing it's true, chanting. I, yeah. I paused it and I was like, wait, there's only like 20 minutes left in this movie. What is going on? Yeah, no, when, when we're finished, I'm going to sum up what happened in this movie. And you're going to realize how little actually happens. So they finally, they realize that the, the head of the native American tribe is also a fan of the commander Cosmo or whatever. And so they get his, his, his um, cooperation and they continue on their mission and the uh, the the two idiot soldiers go back inside the cave. Keep in mind, this is the same cave they tried to escape, and they wanted to go get back up. And now they're going in by themselves again. They leave the the colonel behind, so there's literally no change in 
in what they're doing than when they were there like 40 minutes earlier. At any rate, they make their way to a command console and their plan is to make the rocket launch prematurely, thus stranding the, uh, the, the Amazonians here on Earth. They can't go back home. They can't report back. And so they'll, that, their plan will be foiled. And after more zany shenanigans with the command console where they try everything and nothing works and then uh, and then the idiot asshole uh, Phil Brick sits down and he sits down on the console and happens to sit on the launch button. It launches the rocket. The women burst in. Uh, Pro- Professor Tang is originally ready to kill them, but Dr. Puna says, no, we shouldn't kill them because um, we're stuck here anyway. Uh, we need them. And besides, you know, there's this whole love kissing thing that you got to try out. So then uh, Penn ends up kissing Tanga. And so her brain, her her space dame brain melts down. She has the same reaction as, as Dr. Puna did when Philbrick kissed her. And so they all decide that they're in love with each other and that they should get married. Uh, then the next scene has the colonel awarding the two soldiers with a medal of honor type thing. And then they go off to be with their women who they've now explained that they want to get married and that marriage is essentially slavery. Right. That's actually right. in the movie. My, so, yeah. my last. So like I, I have had written notes and one of my last notes is like slaves question mark exclamation yeah. mark. Not, not, <laughs> not, what? do you, not, do you like slaves, but rather right. similar to slavery? <laughs> yeah. Cause they right. explain the concept of marriage to the space women and they're like, Oh, when you get married, that's what this is. And they're like, Oh, like slaves. And they're like, yes, because the veggie men are slaves, right. by the way, if you didn't realize that, yeah. but uh, <laughs> the look I got from Liz when she saw that scene, <laughs> Oh, no, it was not good. (laughs) It's as if I wrote it. I'm like, holy shit. I can't believe that. Just I'm like, this is my entire reaction. 1962. That's all I could say because I have. Well, you could also say Jonathan picked this one. (laughs) (laughs) I have yet. That's a better way to do it. And Jonathan gets thrown (laughs) under the bus. Dear God, uh, that was so. Yeah, here's no, the, the summary. That, that was that was my favorite part. Is like th- that line at the end of it was just like I'm like, oh God. <laughs> so if if you were wondering, I love that Eric's video froze right what? at the end of that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I did I saw my own freeze? It was it was fantastic. Okay. Yeah. Now I, I want to hear the summary. Oh, God, freeze. <laughs> and like, we should have all just jumped into the air. Ah. Well, um, uh, no, I, here, here's the summary, the, the short version of what I just said. Two idiots stumble on aliens, get captured, escape, get captured, escape, get help, lose help, go back in, defeat aliens, marry aliens. That's what happened. And it could have happened in like 25 minutes, but they stretched it out to 80. Which we thought wouldn't be too bad. I remember 79 minutes. Yeah. I was like, oh, this, this couldn't be that well, bad. If I knew it was a comedy, I wouldn't have picked way it. way longer as I was watching it. Because I thought it was the same thing, too. As I'm going, I'm like, it's short. And then once I finished it, like 31 minutes, I'm like, oh, crap. Really? Yeah, that, that 80 <laughs> minutes was the longest three days of my life. Uh, it was, it was shitty as hell. Yeah, no, that just shows that a bad comedy is just painful. And, um, uh, if it, if it had just been a science fiction B movie, I think we would have really enjoyed it. But because it was just a terrible comedy, it was just, I mean, this, the science fiction B movie stuff was still at least entertainingly, uh, shoddy. I, but yeah. since it was so surrounded by so much terrible comedy. Hmm. But Eric, I think you had uh, the the movie that we might watch next. That um, no, will, will do put I? Us, put us if into the spirit. If you want to do it, I'm totally down to do it. I think okay. we I think we need to do it. I don't think we We're should be gonna left have behind. to pay for it. Wait, bef- yeah. before we get to that, can I can I read just a couple of notes that we didn't get to address in this yes, terrible please, movie? Yes, please, sure. Uh, if you guys don't mind. Okay, so only a couple things I wanted to to bring up in this. I'm not a military historian, but I don't think you can have 40 plus year olds as privates. Is that possible? Can you be in the military that long and never rise the rank of private? Because these guys, I think they're supposed to be young. 
But they're like clearly honest, over 40. At this point, I think the army is having a problem with recruitment. So a 40-year-old who gets through basic, totally possible. Okay, good to know <laughs> about that. Although I don't know how they pass. I don't know how they got through basic. Uh, I mean, I'm just saying, if they pass, they're good. (laughs) This stuff, uh, there's another note. This stuff seems like it'd be fine as Looney Tunes vignettes. And there's, it says parentheses, see snake killing. There's a scene (laughs) in this movie. Oh, that's right. (laughs) Where the troop is walking towards the cave. And they kind of walk in step and they start doing this like kind of dumbass tango thing where they start walking backwards and forwards and the little conga, it's a conga, uh, conga line kind of thing. That's actually what it is. And uh, the music starts coming up and then there's a rattling noise and they cut to this stock image or stock video of a snake that's clearly not even close to being shot at any no. time during this film. <laughs> and so you see this rattlesnake and then you have this really old guy shoot at the rattlesnake and he starts breaking down and crying uh, explaining how he you know he's it, he's not a killer i have a note on that as well <laughs> I, yeah I, I, I'm, I'm not a killer I'm not, i didn't mean to i didn't even know him i shouldn't have done that and like and it kind of reminded me of some looney tune stuff i'd seen before and i don't know if like that's what they were trying to do with this but then there's sergeant glory who's talking like hey man you saved my life doesn't that count for anything cat or whatever he says and it's just like the guy continues to blubber. And that was just like, by the way, this as, at, at this point, I'm thinking, okay, maybe if they had established that this guy was like a hard ass or something and then he shot it and he turns into a blubbering baby, that maybe that'd be funny. But you just meet these guys and they've just been in the room yeah. <laughs> when the two idiots are recruited by Colonel Rank. That's his name. Rank. Brilliant naming. Uh, and... There's no development to any of these characters. I mean, these guys are just idiots. Yeah. Flat out. Let's see. Brain, oh, the brain scans of the uh, Phil Book, uh, Brook and Penn. Uh, when they, oh, yeah. They scan Penn. This is a surprise. They scan Penn, who I thought was the smarter of the two, considering Phil Brick is the guy who, who like, basically flies out of a trash can. Uh, the brain scan on Penn was blank. And that joke just fell so flat. It was like, Oh, no. It was like it was, there was a solid minute between the scan of him and the scan of the other guy where you're just sitting there going, this this is a dead joke. We're dead they could If they just reversed <laughs> it, it would have been funnier because they go to, yeah. to Phil Brick and he's got this idea of, I think it's whatever that space commander something, whatever the hell it's called. He's got his like, fantasy yeah. of that. Then, then they could have gone to the other guy, gone blank, and it would have been like, I don't know, a little bit funnier. But I mean, it's not funny at all. Anything else on this? I do have the cave slash get lost gag again. Is this number four? <laughs> oh, that's right. When when these idiots meet these space women, okay, the first thing they start doing is they start like hitting them with lines. And I'm like, this is a potential title. Hey, baby, you're really out of this world. <laughs> that like like that was it's, gonna work. I mean, come on. <laughs> uh, force field cage of Philbrick, terrible mimes and. Did Professor Tanga actually eye roll to camera? There's a scene yes, where Dr. Puna is, yes, is flat yes. out. She's like, they're having this conversation like in your face. Like, here's one head, here's one. They're just talking. And eventually, like, uh, uh, it's wait. Tango. She doesn't care anymore. She just kind of like turns to camera. And you're like, wait, is that supposed to happen? Wait. Whoa. I think it was right there. I think wait. it was. Repeat that again, Eric, because you went all Skypey. Oh crap! <laughs> what did I say? Um, no, no, no. I think that like the eye roll was the space fever line. It was like right after that. That's oh, when yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. seeing right. it. Yeah, Clearly and I remember being space like space fever, space Love fever roll. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that's yeah. all the only additions I wanted to have there because I was just like, <laughs> some of this genuinely could have been funny. I would say that like there, there this could have been redone. That could be reshot, and if you take out about. Jonathan's right. You take out 50 minutes of this movie, you got a pretty decent little sketch thing. But, yeah. cripes, was it dumb? I mean, and then with, like, just watching it, to, like, in today's modern society and thinking, like, <laughs> shit, that's really racist. That's misogynist. Oh, my God, no. No, this shouldn't be happening. But I'm like, well, it's of the time, I guess. 
uh, or not. I'm like, I don't know. I wasn't around in 62. So I'm hoping and I started looking up some history and things. And I'm like, no, this shit's not even right in 62. So I'm <laughs> yeah, like, no, nah. that's, that's the problem. You watch a movie from 1962. You're like, I don't like, I assume this is how they talked, but was this really bad for 1962? It's possible. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> still not as bad as Rock and Roll Frankenstein. That's still true. not, still not and as I bad as Rock that. that was the first movie that we picked, and I picked it. And it still has a great title. I will yeah. defend that. And Dude, the plot it still has a great plot summary. I could fit that plot summary to anyone, and they'd be like, oh, I want to watch that movie. But <laughs> Invasion of the Star Creatures also has a good title. Like, that yeah, is. And also. Yeah, like the poster. The poster shows more than two space women. Okay, there's only two of them. <laughs> True. <laughs> and like, there's at least two veggie men, and I know they kill a bunch, and they keep using the same ones over and over again. So I'm gonna count them as more a space, like star creatures, I guess. But they're like more like plant creatures. So I don't know. Yeah. I don't. I don't know if we got enough creatures in this one. Yeah. yeah. Well, two Eric. You, uh, <laughs> oh God, what movie were you picking? By the way, they had to pay for. Well, we oh, certainly. Well, I was saying we don't want to get left behind. <laughs> okay. Um, during the I holiday hasn't season. Guessed yet? Come on. Mm, it sounds like a left behind joke. So, what are you talking about? Well, what do you got? <laughs> yeah, let's just say that this film might give us some growing pains. <laughs> oh, is this Kirk Cameron saves Christmas? Yes. Yes. Oh shit! We have to. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we do have to watch it, but do we? Are we going to pay for it? <laughs> you know, well, I I cannot condone piracy, so I will pay for it, and then I will pay for it again <laughs> when I watch it. Okay, I uh, I can't say I think, anything about that, but <laughs> I want to find this thing. How do you even buy this movie? First of all, you can't. Like, like I believe me, I've tried to find every way to get it. Just so I could recommend it. <laughs> Buy tickets now at SavingChristmas.com. I'm waiting for it. Do I have to go to a theater? Oh, um, well, if that's the case, then I'm, I'm, I have a feeling no. that there's no way to, to get there. We, it says find a theater. I'm looking up theaters for myself in this area. Let's see what happens. Oh, wait. They actually have SavingChristmas.com? Uh, yeah. Why don't I have that domain? God damn it. Uh, December 15th. Oh, I just missed it. December 15th was the only day. Shit. This is on forty second. This would have been this would have been a terrible Wait, thing really? to see. Wait, really? December fifteenth only here? What? In Manhattan. <laughs> December fifteenth, New Rock City, eighteen in New Rochelle, New York, which is way the hell out there. Uh, Clifton Commons in Clifton, New Jersey, December fifteenth only. December fifteenth only, Empire Twenty Five Theaters in Manhattan. I have no show times around me either, so we cannot. We can't yeah. even give Kirk Cameron our money. Unless like there's, there's a cam copy of it uh, that is floating around the internet that was yeah. illegal, so we can't use that either. I was well, I mean, I was kind of hoping like I, I I had this bizarre idea that maybe because it would be one of those films that would get limited release, they might do the smart thing and have a digital release as well. That's but apparently that's not the case. No. Well, I mean, then I guess we can't we can't do it. I mean, it's just not possible. So unless we find a source for it, um, then we're kind of stuck. It's really too bad happen. because to be honest, who knows when we're recording between now and that's January. true, because because <laughs> we've got <laughs> we next week is, is Christmas week. The following week is New Year's week and then it's CES. So. Um, yeah. But we probably we might be able to record next week and the week and so, after because it's so not, that's fine. So I yeah, because it's not Christmas Eve or New Year's Eve. So yeah, if we fit it in. But I will say I have another uh, one that just popped up because Vice that was things falling off my desk. Okay, <laughs> Vice just did an article about it. The um, the what was it? How Disney got. Uh, uh, tricked into doing a trippy computer movie and it is uh, Computers Are People 2 1982 uh, if you go to YouTube you'll find it 
uh, and it is 46 minutes long. 46 minutes, 38 seconds. This movie (laughs) explores the possibilities of interaction between man and computer. And the the still is of like a green zombie hand and a... Wait, is that a green hand or is that just a weird lighting on a person? Are you getting... What are you getting? No, you have to click click play for like a second. (laughs) Okay, there it is. It looks... That's Tron. <laughs> oh dear God! So now we've so, watched it together. Hey, so that, now we can't. This not count. This yeah. what? This is my Christmas gift. <laughs> this is all Tron. Is what we're looking at right now. <laughs> that's that's the original Tron. That's that's Master Control Program we're looking at. That's that's not Tron. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's gonna that's be the, <laughs> that's the Tron TV video viewer. game. Hey. Yeah. All right. I'm gonna add it to my watch later uh, queue on yeah. uh, YouTube. Either way, it's gonna be one you're gonna have to take notes on, just like off the start, because it's. I assume it's gonna be documentary style where we're laughing a lot. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I figure. I figure it might teach me a thing or two. I don't know about computers. About computers. So. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they're people too. Oh gosh! So, like, the, well, uh, I done learned all I need to know about people. <laughs> that I, I learned everything I need to know from Invasion of the Star Creatures. Oh my God! Oh, I'm so sad we can't watch Kirk Cameron. <laughs> it is it is a damn shame. I I cannot believe that there's not a digital distribution for that movie already, but because uh, it seems like it's just a wasted opportunity. And he's and he's attacking everyone who's attacking the movie. Like we have we have directors favoriting our tweets about their <laughs> crappy movies. Like, come on, Kirk Cameron bump. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, we'll just have to wait for next year. <laughs> well, you know, wait, wait, wait a second. Wait a second. Wait a second. There are a number of Kirk Cameron movies on Netflix. There's Left Behind, Left Behind 2, we've already seen 2, Monumental, which I don't know anything about, uh, Fireproof, and Kirk Cameron Unstoppable. So if you want to stick to this... I've watched like, Unstoppable. It's I Like, I have to count that one out. <laughs> so there's Fireproof, which looks like a dedicated <laughs> firefighter's marriage is about to end in divorce, but just when hope seems to be running out... His Christian father intervenes. Hold on. That's are right. you are you advocating right now to watch a Kirk Cameron? Well, I'm saying because we can't see his Saving Christmas movie, which has like I think the most kick-ass movie, movie poster. That is, I mean, that's a really kick-ass poster. Okay, he's got like he's, he's got yeah. a, he's swinging towards you, holding a candy cane. He looks like he's gonna save Christmas or smack you in the face with a candy cane. So like, <laughs> obviously, that's awesome. Or monumental. Which is more about, and then Eric's just left. Uh, monumental. Kirk Cameron hosts this look at America's past and the bedrock principles and the ideas that its founding father. Oh, I already can't finish this. Fireproof. I'm going to add this to my queue, which is not the movie for the week. Eric is connecting. I'm looking at the. I'm now. I'm reading a review on <laughs> about saving Christmas. It's parents like, need, good. Yeah, parents need to know that Kirk Cameron's Saving Christmas isn't a politically motivated indictment of the <laughs> secular humanist movement to remove religious Christian symbols from public spaces or the war on Christmas. It's actually a response to Christians who think Santa lights and trees, parties and expensive presents dilute the true meaning of the season. Cameron takes those Christians to task by arguing that there's a way to see widely celebrated Christmas Christmas customs. Uh, as symbolic of not only Jesus's birth, but of salvation and more. Like most faith-based films, Saving Christmas seems directed specifically to evangelical Christian audiences. Those who see it should know that there's some minor violence in historical recreations of St. Nicholas attacking a heretic and of King Herod's soldiers rounding up babies. Now I'm reading reviews of uh, uh, Fireproof. What was it? My just my favorite line out of uh, I think I think the Washington Post article was the one that I posted. But but the uh, uh, God, what was the line? It was something like, why is Santa good? Because I like Sweden. 
that's about yeah. the logic you're going to get from this film. <laughs> okay, listen to this review of, of Fireproof, the movie I'm advocating for for some God knows reason. Oh, it's okay, already the wife, in the list. So, <laughs> the, this is okay. So, the wife was such a selfish harpy that it would have been more satisfying to watch the main character divorce her. Instead, he <laughs> sacrifices every part of himself, Wait, including. This is what it says. This is the review. Okay, this is not. This is not the description. Instead, he sacrifices every part of himself, including his own masculinity, trying to save their marriage while his wife is off having an emotional affair and rebuffing all of his efforts. This movie follows a typical men are evil. Women are perfect no matter what mentality that has led to so many marriages failing in the first place. This movie is two hours long, I is. It's an hour and 58 minutes. Oh, we're watching your 46-minute pick. I might <laughs> okay. watch this for the, for the hell of it just because I can just turn it off and do whatever. Uh, but I bet you could watch this at work because I'm pretty sure it's not going to have like Yeah, you're, you're new probably new safe on that one. One hour, 58 minutes. Gee. Best guess for PWP, my profile where I rate movies that I hate <laughs> very highly. Four stars. The average, the average for 1.4 million ratings is 4.1 stars. No, it's got is, a super high. It's actually got a 6.5 on IMDb. So I'm looking at Fireproof. I, I'm looking at the, the you know, it's a starring Kirk Cameron and Aaron Bathia. And I was wondering what else Erin Bethia has been in. So I clicked on her name. She's been in This Is Our Time, five friends connected by their strong faith and belief in God set out to make a difference in the world following graduation. And also The Heart of Christmas. When Austin and Julie's young son is diagnosed with cancer, they decide to give him one last Christmas, even if it has to be in October. Nobody's picking that movie. No, I, I won't do it. You don't want to watch The Heart of Christmas? I'm not, I'm not doing it. You don't want to watch a heartwarming story? <laughs> of a dying child? Is it, I mean, it's, I, if, this, if this crosses over with Daddy Can't Dance, I would watch it. <laughs> <laughs> only, only because shit would work out magically like six times over. We cured your cancer. There is no cancer. And by the way, your, your child is a time traveler. Like some bullshit can, like that can, at the end. And can do a mean robot. <laughs> and who are you oh i'm the not introduced really important character yeah right i'm the two guys that are also on your team to help give a final christmas <laughs> oh, to your kid wait, wait, wait. we just weren't introduced Fire until the very end fireproof i'm sorry it, like fireproof is pg and it's two hours long like oh oh what were you hoping for <laughs> I was I was at least hoping for like PG thirteen or something. Maybe there was some scene that was just like a little intense. Dude, you picked a talking cat question mark exclamation <laughs> point question mark. So you have no room to criticize. I... All right, so, <laughs> so we've got the forty six minute computer movie that Eric picked that's on YouTube, and then we've got fireproof. That if you, for some reason, <laughs> want to watch, you can do that, too. I'm sure I as will have plenty to say uh, about We're going to watch it. It's going to happen. Yeah, I have a feeling we're going to end up watching both of these goddamn gonna things. Happen. I'm going to watch all you. of all of Aaron Bathia's stuff. I think I do eventually have to go with <laughs> the This is our time. Walk. And I'm going to add in uh, The Heart of Christmas on my list here. And then when I see it, I'm like, well, how drunk was I when I picked these? <laughs> Sober, stone sober. They, I have not had a, a drop of alcohol today. So, so, so the best part about this is we'll get into the new year and then we'll just be the most blasphemous podcast we could possibly be. Can't wait to watch Harder Christmas in February. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, you're a dad, I guess. I don't know if you wanna if you wanna watch that particular movie. That might that might be a little uh, a little grim. That was the initial thought I had too, and I'm thinking because you're this is over one of the, it, you got over that fast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, <laughs> I was just thinking, you know what? I I have a feeling this movie's gonna work out just fine at the end, just just <laughs> fine. Um, you know, I think you have a good feeling about it. I guess it might. I mean, it's the heart of Christmas, <laughs> even though it's gonna be. You know, I'm just gonna screw. It. I'm just gonna watch it now and go to the end. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna <laughs> find out how this now. thing ends. 
right I, I now. Watched, I watched the last two minutes Next to a tiny film. tombstone, and you're like, holy shit, that got dark. If they get that dark, I'm going to love it. My three sons' films, I'm going to the end. It's Weird. an hour and 25 minutes. It thinks what? so. Netflix thinks that it, its best guess for me is like three and a half stars for is that this movie. The Heart of Christmas. Is that the Heart of Christmas. Specific. Oh, all right, to be three point three stars. The average is four point three. All right. So there's like a vigil at the end for the kid, and it looks like there's going to be there's an epilogue. I'm trying to get to the epilogue. Wait, is this movie actually sponsoring St. Jude? Here you go. Dax died a few weeks later. His life and story continued to inspire others. And in honor, in his honor, a foundation was established to raise $1.7 million, enough to run St. Jude Children's Research Hospital for an entire day. It's inspired by a true story. So this is, this is a dramatization so this, of an yes, actual wait. story. There's more because I accidentally went to the second thing. Let's see. The grief Julie and Austin experienced after Dax's passing was greatly eased by all the love and support they received. Yeah, okay. I don't, I don't know how that even works. And let's see. Lastly, <laughs> they now have a daughter, Madeline Elizabeth, named after Elizabeth Dunford and live by the motto Dax taught them. Cherish every moment. So they just replaced the kid. They and- did. I guess they didn't replace the kid. <laughs> okay, I'm backing <laughs> off now. I'm backing is, off on this, this one. This is the epilogue. I'm just saying that there may be. I'm just. I'm officially saying <laughs> this movie is you probably are a fantastic fun movie. Of a movie. <laughs> that is it was a better for Jude. Oh yeah, man. I I'm distancing <laughs> myself from Aya's the evil man. <laughs> hey, that was the first because thought I had. I didn't say it was like not, a thought. See, when I saw this, I thought it was just going to be a, you know, one of those like attempts at a heartwarming tale. Having no, I didn't even know it was inspired by a true story because when I was looking at the, the original logo, it was the tiny version, right? And I just see the heart of Christmas and I read the little thing and I'm like, whoa, this sounds ridiculous. And then I'm like, oh, wait, it's inspired by a true story. Well, that changes things, obviously. I mean, that's not, it's not someone's attempt to pull at your heartstrings. It's more of a, this was uh, uh, this was an event that really emotionally affected real people, and we thought the story was worth telling, and this is our version of telling it. And I'm like, well, that's totally different than a couple of cynical assholes sitting down to write something and trying to figure out, like, how can we emotionally manipulate our audience? So it's a very different... That's why I'm backing off. I'm like, Listen, whoa, shit, I, no. I'll, I'll back up Ayaz's argument with they just replaced the child at the end, having That's not just, seen this Well, wait, film. It's, it's only written in text. It's not like they have another kid and they're like laughing with a candle or something. That would be horrible. That's horrible. I need to stop talking oh. immediately. Because <laughs> I didn't really... As, so here's the thing, though. Like, so you were telling me in, one, in my earbuds that this stuff is like, oh, it's based on a real story. I'm not... I'm trying to find like a clip. I'm like, I'm kind of leaving it in the back of my head. And it's not until like I'm reading the second thing out loud do I realize what you had said, that this was real. I'm like, oh shit. And so yeah. of course, <laughs> of course the first thing that comes to my head was that they replaced a the kid. And then it hits me that I have fucked up beyond repair. <laughs> so I'm sorry to that family. I, I hope you don't watch this show. And if you do, and you were a fan of anything we've ever done, those two guys had nothing to do with it. It's not their fault. It's Listen, my fault. There's a hundred some odd episodes where we haven't insulted you. Yeah. So, so just watch that's... those. <laughs> and don't forget that if you get the like the love and warmth of like your friends or something, that'll make shit better. That's what the epilogue said too. So Yeah. I've really wow. gotta stop talking. You, you shit. do. We're done. It's, it's, it's my fault, man. It's my fault. I, I clicked on the actress's <laughs> name and I was like, oh, look at this. There's a theme I'm spotting in the It went to a dark, movie. dark path. I mean, this this is not yeah. worse than Star Creatures, what I'm saying. No. But it's pretty fucking offensive. It's like getting up there. <laughs> so Well and, Well, I hope we've atoned for Ayaz's terrible mistake. <laughs> 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 I should not be laughing this hard at this. Oh, that is horrible. Oh. I have a son. He's going to be so angry. Anyway. We when he watches us. Come on. <laughs> He'll watch it in 20 years and be like, Dad, you're an asshole. Here's the thing. Like, yeah. <laughs> people, yeah, it's people be who, a while. Here, here's the deal, guys. Also, if he watches this in 20 years, 
that's that's bad. You gotta he's you gotta like you gotta aim higher. I is. Yeah, you're here's this, here's like, the, the problem set. though. The problem is that people who do listen to this <laughs> show and watch this show will do the work to find the Twitter handle of somebody <laughs> who is involved in this and tweet to them what we've said. That is the world well, we live in now. So it will come back to us. <laughs> that may be a good thing. I mean, come on. Like, if Kirk Cameron wants to call us out as assholes, I'm okay with it. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking more of the heart of Christmas, but okay, sure. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not worried about that. Well, let's go. <laughs> All right, so, so uh, Eric uh, and I as both yet say, come at me, bro. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> I'm washing my hands in this one. Next week on Podcast Without Pretense. I can't believe how you guys got raked over the coals like that. I guess I told you so. I, my heartwarming tale will become a movie, too, and I will be just as cynical about it. Do they still sell pitchforks? Like, where do you buy pitchforks? <laughs>